Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right. Welcome back to Full Prefrontal. I am here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. Good to be with you. Looking forward to today's conversation. Thank you, Todd. I want to start with a journey of a mosquito net. Half a million people in Africa die of malaria. And it is a huge health crisis. And scientists have studied this problem and really have come up with an ingenious solution. So they thought. What they did is they designed this wonderful small meshed mosquito net and they treated it with insecticide in hopes that when, you know, people in Africa begin to use it, that will really prevent this crisis of uh, being bitten by mosquitoes. The mechanism worked this way, that person sleeps under the net, the net has small mesh and it's treated with the insecticide. So when a person breathes out carbon dioxide, mosquitoes will be attracted to the net. But as they come closer, their cuticles touch the net, which is uh, has insecticide, and that eventually will cause the death and problem solved. Brilliant idea, well supported, well founded. And so many people, many companies got behind it. Billions of dollars were poured into it and they produced these mosquito nets and they dropped it in Africa. Great. Many people did use it and just the way it was designed. However, what they did not anticipate is ingenious mind of a human being. Mosquito nets were not just limited to be used as mosquito nets, but they also became a source of innovation. Some people began to use it as bridal veils. (laughs) Some began to use as soccer balls. They even lined the chicken coop with mosquito nets. That was all well and dandy because that didn't cause any problems. The real problem became when the fishermen in this coastal region of Africa began to use this as uh, fishing nets. Now, unfortunately, so you can imagine, they open the packet, take the mosquito nets, join many mosquito nets together, and off the fisherman goes. Unfortunately, because they had been treated with insecticide, of course, it now created a new problem, which was a problem of contamination. So as you can see, the scientists who developed this magic bullet, so they thought, to really treat a health crisis in Africa, managed to kind of contain that, but created a new crisis of pollution. Mm. This is a common problem that we all face, that when we solve problems for ourselves, for the future, to take care of our future self, sometimes we need to do this simulation of the future. That means what will it look like if I do this? What will it look like if I do that? And this is what leads us to come up with plan A, then plan B. And then even plan A and B doesn't work, then we come up with something called plan C. However, we do need a mental space where we come up with these problems and solutions for our problems. And sometimes that fails and sometimes it does work well. So we are going to have a wonderful speaker today, Professor Hal Hirschfield, who's going to talk a lot about this wonderful notion of future self. All right. Well, this promises to be a very intriguing conversation. Very much looking forward to it. So let's get to Sujeda's conversation with Hal Hirschfield. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Hal Hirschfield, Assistant Professor of Marketing at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. Dr. Hirschfield's work aims to understand how thinking about time can alter people's judgment and decisions and transform their emotions. His main work examines the way that people consider their future selves and how feelings of connection to these distant selves can impact their decision-making. One of Dr. Hirschfield's most well-known Discovery suggests that when people are confronted with their future selves, they experience an emotional sense of connection that can influence long-term financial and ethical decision-making. He has been a consultant to Prudential Insurance Company's Bring Your Challenges campaign, American Greetings Principal Finance Group, Morningstar, and many others. Merrill Lynch has implemented his face aging study in a marketing context to try to influence consumer behavior towards purchasing its products. Dr. Hirschfield received the 2011 Association for Psychological Science Rising Star Award, recognizing him for being an outstanding psychological scientist in the early stages of his research career 
post PhD whose innovative work has already advanced the field and signaled great potential for his continued contribution. Dr. Hirschfeld's connection to behavioral science as well as behavioral economics has added tremendous value in understanding one's own connection to future behavior. I can't wait to welcome Dr. Hirschfeld to our podcast today. Welcome to the show, Hal. I'm truly excited for what you're going to talk about today. So let me jump right into it. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about that the role of prefrontal lobe and the simulation that it allows people to experience. So we use many mental tools, including working memory, visual imagery, for example, doing a mental plan and moving things in that working memory to conceptualize and problem solve. And the simulation that activating the picture or experience or video of this this thing that we might uh, run into or go get into helps us imagine the results. So how does the mental simulation work and what do the prefrontal cortex do? So, you know, I, I think when we, when we talk about simulation, you know, there's all sorts of types of simulation, right? So, and in fact, there's, you know, a lot of psychologists and philosophers who say this, this is the thing that really is at the center of our consciousness. This is the thing that makes us truly human is our ability to essentially simulate other minds, simulate other times, simulate, you know, different possible worlds, you know, thinking probabilistically about about the world around us. And so what I'm particularly interested in with regards to simulation is the way that we can simulate not just other minds and other times, but essentially simulate the minds of our of our future selves or our past selves, or in other words, ourselves at different points in time. And I've specifically looked at this on a neural level, which is to say, the brain can can pretty pretty accurately detect what's me and what's not me. And so this is the medial prefrontal cortex uh, mm-hmm. that's often involved in this, right? So it's sort of a portion yeah. of that. And the rostral anterior cingulate that can essentially show higher activation patterns. So that is you know, more blood flow to that part of the brain uh, when we're thinking about ourselves compared to when we're thinking about another person. And what my colleagues and I did, this is several years ago now, though. I just read another paper that sort of replicated this result and extended it. What we did is we said, you know, is it possible that people think of the future self as if it is another person? And maybe that can underlie some of the reasons why we're often so bad at making these sort of long-term decisions. You know, if we think of that distant self as if it's really separate from who we are now, as if it's another person, well, that's not going to help us really take action today. Um, and so we ran a study where we put people into the scanners and we had them make judgments about the self today and the self in 10 years and another person today and another person in 10 years. And our thinking was that, you know, hey, we already know that this portion of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex, can detect me versus not me. Would we see a similar pattern when someone thinks about me now versus me in 10 years time? That is future Mm -hmm. me. And in fact, we did. We saw this similar pattern arise such that you get this difference between me and someone else. And then you see a very similar difference between me and me in 10 years uh, on a brain level. And so we thought that was a, you know, a a sort of an interesting demonstration that maybe this region and and set of regions really are not only saying sort of what's me and what's not me, but also sort of underlying this difference between me today and me in the future. Wow. And that's, of course, you have gotten a lot of questions about this direction of your research. And it's extremely fascinating because it's something people can see. The research study that you just mentioned where you presented with a digitally altered image of themselves, but the gap between those people. So these were 20-year-old students and they saw themselves at age 60 or 70. And that gap was much vivid and kind of um, remarkable for them to not deny that, oh my God, this is a person, not me. <laughs> right. So sorry. So that's a separate study. Um, oh, I and, see. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I, it's, that's, you know, you're right to bring that up. It's um, really, I think it, it fits right in there. So the study I was talking about was just people making judgments about themselves now and themselves in the future while they're relying in a scanner. And then we, we essentially followed oh, without that Without any visual imagery. Without no visual imagery. Exactly. I got it. Yes. I remember um, that study. Yes. Right. And then we followed that up by saying, well, maybe one way that we could actually get people to 
to really think more effectively and more more realistically about their future selves would be to present these vivid visual images of themselves at, say, retirement age. So that is, like you said, taking a 20-year-old college student and and showing them an image of themselves when they're 65. So we, you know, we age progress those images. And we show that, that that help people act more patiently in financial decision tasks. But you know, I think what you're bringing up would be fascinating, which is to say, my gosh, if we could show people these vivid visual images of themselves at an older point of time and get them to really simulate that future self and to step into the shoes of, of their future selves, you know, would we see some of those neural differences that tend to underlie the difference between me now and me in the future? Would we see those go away? Uh, because yeah. maybe people could more accurately, more emotionally, more deeply, more intensely step into the shoes and see the world through the eyes of those future selves. Such a fascinating topic. So can I ask you a more detailed yeah. question regarding this direction of time travel? So Absolutely. we can travel back in time and we can travel in a future. And right. why did these abilities develop in humans? And is there any particular reason, like the evolutionary role that you can explain to our listeners that these functions came by? Uh, it's, you know, it's a great question that... Any um, speculation? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It, it really is a great question that, you, that you're raising there. Um, in a way, you could argue that evolutionarily speaking, this is somewhat of a new, a new skill, you know, because... Well, think about it this way. We could think about mental time travel as being on all different scales, right? So yes. I can mentally time travel to tonight and think about what is it that I'm going to want for dinner? You know, that is a form of mentally traveling in time. I can also think about, should I start considering how much money I need to put aside for my wife's birthday present in four months? You know, that's a different time frame. And then I can also, of course, the sort of canonical version is to think about who will I be and what will I need in retirement? Well, of course, that longer time frame, which could be on the order of, you know, anywhere from, of course, next year to 40, 50 years away, right? That's a span of mental time travel that didn't really make sense back when what was most important was saying, how much do we need to put away in terms of the food that we need for our family and our, you know, hunter and gatherer tribes, right? And so that's still a type of mental time travel. And there are debates that have raged in the literature about whether there are certain animals that, you know, when they put food away, are they in fact mentally traveling in time? But I don't think that's precisely to... I was referring to that even yeah. when the monkeys, they saved it, but they did not have this sense that what you save is what you can eat and they took away the food. Is that the um, reference? Yeah, I was, that that's is? exactly what I was thinking about. There's some work, there's some work on birds as well when they, well, yeah. they put away food, to, you know, are they doing it because they're saving it for later or is it a response to the competitors and what does that really mean? And, the, you know, this is one of these questions that's fascinating to discuss, but also hard to answer. Right. But, you know, yes. the, the ability to to be able to step backward and forward in time, I, I think, has its roots in some of this, which is to say planning. Right. Which is to say planning for, you know, whether it's inclement weather, what you know, and how that might affect uh, our, our living space. You know, again, I'm talking about sort of our our ancestors from a, a long time ago? Or is it about thinking about future responses to predators? And I think these faculties developed with that very, those those very real sort of um, stimuli in mind, mm -hmm. uh, but they've been developed uh, in our brains such that we're often, you know, we use a similar part of the brain to be able to step backward and forward in time. So, so there's these symmetries between not only being able to look ahead in time, but also to be able to look backward in time. And of course, this is where our memories come from and our ability to relive the past and feel nostalgic for it uh, is you know, a similar process that underlies the ability to say, prospect and think ahead in time and, and consider the future consequences of present decisions. So one of the ways in my work, when I uh, work with people with executive dysfunction, yeah. I work on helping them create schemas and yes. so Roy Bomeister talks about this, that we can use this time travel abilities to travel through space and culture. So this experience travel, that means if you don't, you have no experience of being stranded at the airport, then you never can prepare yourself in order to be stranded at the airport. 
And so that <laughs> yeah, is, a lot of people that in my work who are taking poor decisions, they're impulsive, they lack the self-restraint, they lack that uh, self-regulation, they are acting as if this is the first time they are experiencing so yeah. I see a disconnect between their ability to jog their past experience and connect it to future possibilities where they might be in trouble. So right. the direction, go ahead. So, oh, no, I was just going to say, I think that's a, uh, yeah, I think it's a fascinating insight. And I think, you know, what this, what this really suggests is that, you know, if, if executive function underlies some of these abilities to step forward or in time or to simulate the future in these future possible worlds, if that function is compromised, then it suggests that, you know, just trying to tell somebody to really think about what it'll feel like, you know, that could be one route, but it might not be the most effective one. Whereas another one to do is to say, create a bunch of if then sort of scenarios, you know, if this happens, then I do that. And then I don't have to do the difficult mental time travel of saying, what will the future be like? I just say, if I get into this situation, then I know that this is the thing that I have to do, because that's the habit, that's the heuristic, that's the, the shortcut that I've been you know, taught and that I've learned myself to create sort of my, my most sort of efficient personal environment. So can I quickly go in the direction of that concept of future self and emotional connection yeah. to that future self? So my experience from, again, uh, my work in executive functions, that when we relate to the world, we need to have activation of our sense of who you are. And then when we interact with others, we have to take perspective of who, who they are. And we do this song and dance by going back and forth. So those with executive dysfunction are not able to suppress their thoughts about themselves uh, that often. And they are not able to activate thoughts about needs of others or uh, perspectives of others or, or their intended actions. And so they the, that theory of mind issue is quite impaired for them. And what I find that they are so impulsive, but they become self-imposing, they become selfish appearing, or they become self-indulgent. So any thoughts about that notion of future self is really kind of suppressing your temptation to indulge yourself of the current moment. You hit on so many interesting things there. I mean, that's, first off, I think you're absolutely right that part of this issue is comes down to this sort of theory of mind concept, right? This ability to essentially understand what it is that's happening in the minds of others, which as we know is a, you know, th this would fall into the categories of sort of difficult but necessary adult skills to require, to acquire, right? Um, yes. And, you know, so much of child rearing is essentially trying to get kids to understand what, you know, what it is that other kids might be thinking when you behave this way. What exactly. might I be thinking when you behave this way, right? And so, exactly. and a lot of these sort of, long-term decision-making and even short-term decision-making, but, you know, we could call it sort of the bucket that we could call it intertemporal decision-making, right? These decisions that occur over time. A lot of what that relies on is this ability to essentially develop a theory of mind for our future selves as well. And to say, you know, yes. what will, you know, future me think and feel? And when I engage in a certain action or, or don't, you know, how will I feel what will I think about in the future? And by, by the way, the, the same works in reverse when it comes to regret. You know, just as a side note, we haven't sort of published anything about this, but it's my contention that so much of regret arises because we have an inability to essentially develop a theory of mind of our past self. You know, why was it that I acted that way? Well, if I could really step inside the shoes and mind of my, my past self, then I might understand, well, why I did act that way. And I might not experience quite as much regret as I would have otherwise. So I think, you know, and I, I'm just raising exactly. that to bring up the idea of looking at how that sort of works symmetrically with thinking about the future self. Incredible. So can I get you to talk about the George Bailey effect? This comes from the timeless film of This Wonderful Life, where James Stewart plays this character called George Bailey. And as uh, the movie unfolds, George sees the events that would have gone some uh, right. way. He was never born. And that gives him a huge perspective and a renewed appreciation for what life is. So this is an example of traveling back in time. Like it was exactly on the... Uh, yeah, on the regret. I, How do we I like love this. I, you know, it's funny. I hadn't ever thought about it this way, but you know, you're absolutely right. Sorry, when I think about that movie, I just think about, you know, hot chocolate and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and winter. Yes. You know, and, and in a way, you know, what, what we would talk about with that movie is we'd say, you know, that's a it's almost a canonical example of what's known as counterfactual reflection. So pardon the, the, the big words there, but counterfactual reflection is saying, let's think about, this is not just thinking about the past 
but what you know what's happening in that movie, and I and I and I see why you bring it up, is that he's thinking about what would the world be like in an alternate world, in an alternate yes. scenario. And and this is a very concrete one. The alternate scenario is a world in which George Bailey is never born. And he's able to essentially witness that. And and by doing so, it essentially imbues his meaning with more, uh, sorry, his life with more meaning and it and it and it shows just the impact that he has, right? And this is, in fact, several years ago, I actually published a paper with some colleagues, um, Adam Glinsky and Laura Cray uh, and Braden King, where we showed that when you actually ask people to reflect counterfactually, they become more committed to the things that they, that you know, that were the target of that counterfactual reflection. So if I think about what would my life be like if I hadn't met my wife? It all of a sudden, it's a very, you know, this is a different way of approaching the world than saying, what's my life like because I met my wife? It's saying, what path would I be on? Who would I be with? What would I be doing? All these things. And, you know, conditional on things being positive right now, that actually can imbue more connection and more commitment to my spouse or to my company or to even, you know, my country. If I say, what would the world be like if the U.S. never existed, et cetera? And so, you know, I think this this concept of counterfactual reflection relies on you to essentially say, you know, I'm bringing this is a kind of long aside, but I'm bringing it up to say it relies on you to not only essentially simulate another time, which is, say, the past up until now, but it also asks you to simulate another possible world. Right. You now have to think about the sort yes. of possibility that the world would be different. And, and this is exactly the type of thing that underlies some of the decisions that we have to make about the future, instead of counterfactual thinking, we, we call it prefactual thinking, which is to say, what would happen if I were to forget my umbrella today? What would happen if I were to skim a little money off of the top? You know, what would happen if I were to cheat on my spouse or not? And these are, you know, I, the, I raise all of these possibilities because a lot of this work touches on sort of ethical decisions where you say to somebody, if you were to do this thing that might be gratifying right now, what would happen in the future versus what would happen if you didn't do that thing? And so, you know, we can go from the sort of mundane and the banal from preparing for the weather to sort of these big decisions about how should I act and what should I do to maybe something in the middle. Uh, you know, what would my life be like if I did or didn't say what would my life be like if I sort of did go through with this educational course or not, et cetera. And so I think you know, what you brought up with George Bailey is a fascinating way of connecting these things together. Well, this uh, kind of my brain is just uh, now bustling with ideas. What uh, what you just said, uh, so many things to we can talk about. Well, one story comes to my mind is that movie, Gwyneth Paltrow's movie called Sliding Doors. Do you remember Sliding that? Doors, yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> so, so what I find that these experiences that we go into the movie theater and allow ourselves to visualize, conceptualize our experience, give us a little mental break to not having to do that to us, but learn from experiences of others. So to me, these mental tools that we have just been talking about are all self-regulatory tools that, that say uh, this if-then scenario, if this happened and that will happen, if I take this path, then that will be the outcome. And then based on these hypothetical scenarios, we are able to take better decisions. What happens if you are not able to, um, either you don't have that kind of working memory space uh, because of some type of injury? What if you don't have that visual you know, capacity for visual imagery? Or what if you generally have problems in in problem solving? <laughs> are they, uh, is there research that you have done or you are familiar with that you can share that causes people to then run into problems because they're just not doing this kind of time traveling back and forth? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. You know, there's some the, some work by, older work by um, Antoine Bechera and Antonio Damasio and others yes. with the Iowa, the Iowa card task, which is basically a, a task that, you know, allows people, it's like essentially a game where you are, I haven't actually described it in a while, so forgive me for sounding a little rusty, but it's a, a game where you're choosing cards between different decks and one deck has high risk, high reward cards in so much as you might pick a card and you could lose all the money that you have, or you could gain a lot. And another deck has cards that are, you know, much lower risk, but also lower reward. And so this, you know, the safer play over time is to choose from that deck. But people who have certain 
neurological damage and can't accurately simulate what's in one deck or another and can't accurately simulate how they'll feel if they if they pick a losing card often will end up going for the riskier deck uh, repeatedly. And so there are situations where this could pay off, right? If the risk ends up being rewarding. But there's also situations where it could cause, you know, a lot of damage, which is a great proxy for real world decisions that carry with them a lot of risk, right? You could make a big risky investment that could pay off and you could look like brilliant investor, or it could really tank and you could have to explain to your shareholders why you made that decision. Or on a more personal level, you know, well, I guess it's hard to come up with specific examples there, but uh, the, the idea being that with, you know, the inability to essentially simulate these other experiences and outcomes, it can be really difficult to then make the decisions that will end up causing sort of the safest outcomes the, the majority of the time. Yeah. And then the, it's, it's the gambling behavior, the, this uh, behavior where you are, your risk aversive <laughs> tendencies are shut off, I guess, or completely yeah. tuned off. <laughs> and I see that in a lot of my uh, patient population, particularly with concussion or traumatic brain injury, where they are either doing the same behavior that did not get them the desired outcome again and again, or they are taking risky decisions where the benefit may be great under certain circumstances, but the the damage or the risk is way, way too high. I'll give you a quick example. Um, I I had a a patient who was extremely impulsive and he, of course, lacked the ability to simulate what will happen if I do this. And he was at 2 a.m. at a major junction in uh, downtown Atlanta, not the most safest place. And literally did not think there was any reason why he should be waiting for the light to turn red so he can cross safely. So he Mm. hopped uh, along and then one car came and hit him. (laughs) There was no traffic, but that one car was not anticipating because it was 2 a.m. He was not anticipating any cars because it was 2 a.m. And then that just uh, led to this disaster. So sometimes I think that risk uh, taking behaviors, which we modulate or kind of control through these thoughts about future, which may not be like way, way distant future. It could be immediate future, right? Yes. And in that particular case, you know, you could say that that's partly time travel, but it's only also partly just, you know, simulating other possible worlds, right? You know, exactly. so it, exactly. it's like, you know, and, and a lot of this relies on a, a task that's difficult, even for people with healthy, non-damaged brains, which is to say, so many of the decisions that we make are probabilistic in nature, you know, so Many people know that if I were to walk across the street with a red light or drive across or whatever, there is a probability and it's reasonably high enough that a car will come and hit me and so I don't do it. But there are a lot of other decisions that we make where the probabilities are not as clearly defined, you know, and this is something that, of course, happened with with the, the presidential election back in November, where many analysts were saying, Hillary Clinton has a 70% chance or an 80% chance of winning. And what that means is to say, if you were to have this election 100 times, 80 of those times it would come out in Hillary's favor and 20 of those times it would come out in Donald Trump's favor, which means it's not a surefire bet. It's a similar thing with a NFL kicker. You know, exactly. he has a 70% chance of making a field goal from 30 yards out, which means that Seven out of 10 times he'll make that, but there are those three times where he won't. And that's that's how we reason probabilistically about the world. But if part of that reasoning relies on being able to simulate all the different possibilities and say, am I willing to take that risk or am I not? But if you can't do that simulation, then the inputs of that simulation won't factor into your decision about whether I should cross the street or not, whether I should invest in the stock or not, whether I should, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so I think it's a it's, it's a good it's a, you know. It's a painful example that you raised, but it's it is nonetheless definitely relies on these similar sort of um, cognitive capabilities. So I see this as a marriage between the two is like failure to envision and the theory of mind kind of I'll give you another example that recently I came across this uh, decision about using, you know, her president's role in using nuclear power. And apparently when President Roosevelt died in 1945, Truman took over and that was the first time on um, first day on the job, he discovered that we have nuclear bomb. And he was told that uh, this was a, a just another weapon, bigger and better. And by then, the U.S. was in war with Japan for three years. And they were, they were um, and it was clear that uh, he needed to use it. And so when he 
envisioned using the weapon, he said, I'm going to strictly, he announced, he, I'm strictly going to use this as a military weapon. And the purpose of his, uh, uh, rather in, in his journal, uh, journal, he entered that uh, we will not use it on civilians. There will not be killings of women and children. And when the bomb exploded and the results, he got the debriefing, the 200,000 people had died. Right. And he had no capacity to vision it. But then within two days, another bomb was dropped without even consulting him. So he, the, the, what you can't prevent what you can't envision. So the, I can see that how realistic is this process for us to stay on top of our future <laughs> with this kind of pro- yeah. complicated variability? Uh, no, I mean, it's, I mean, there's so many factors that influence this, right? Because we can talk about decisions that we have a lot of experience with, right? So I would say the most part, many of us have decision, you know, have made the decision to wake up early and do something we said we we're going to do or sleep in, you know, or to eat something healthy or to say, ah, that donut looks really good. And, you know, we might have a pretty accurate representation of what's going to happen on the other side. I'm going to feel guilty for having indulged or maybe I'll have really enjoyed it. But this is something I kind of know. Right. It does require you to to sort of do this sort of simulation and this theory of mind calculation. But I have experience with it. But then you talk about the realm like this with, you know, Truman and the bomb and whatnot. And you say this is kind of a scenario that we've that we're not prepared for. And it's very difficult to be able to really do this sort of exercise properly. And now, you know, of course, there's a big difference between 70 years ago and today when many government decisions are in theory made with a host of intelligence. But that's not always the case. Right. So, you know, the latest I was reading about Trump deciding to launch the airstrike on Syria suggested that there was sort of a lengthy decision-making process, and there are multiple scenarios, and then there are probabilities of what would happen in each scenario. We don't know, though. We don't know what actually happened. We don't know what, you know, was on the, the other side of those decisions and how they went. But I would say, you know, this is where more modern decision-makers are trying to, to move to, right? To say, if I do this, if I do X, then what are the, you know, outcomes A, B, and C that could occur, and with what, you know, probability and what will each of those outcomes lead to, et cetera? And it's essentially like saying, let's play chess with life. Now, that's a scenario that you can imagine requires some sort of intense, directed thought that's done with others. That's a completely different type of decision than a much more spur of the moment decision that we have to make on our own. And so it's, you know, it's difficult to compare these different scenarios because one has a lot more inputs, a lot more people, the wisdom of crowds, et cetera. And the other one has, you know, just me, the decision maker, driving the ship, trying to figure out what to do. And both are prone to different sources of error. Yes. Oh, so complicated. <laughs> yeah. let, me, let me ask you then if we have solutions for this. So now, so we know future thinking and thinking about future self is such an important and integral part of our our betterment uh, towards the future outcomes. So how do we change ourselves? How do we change ourselves over time? Or how do we change our mind? Like, for example, we know giving up, bad, a bad, uh, giving up smoking or, you know, um, drinking or late, staying up late, all those are things. And we don't like really commit to the changes that we know are good, good for us. So that failure to act that you talk about in your research. And the second part, if you can t- come, uh, help us understand is, how do we take all this knowledge uh, to become a better person? How do I give up bad habits? How do I become less critical of others? How do I be open to complex social issues, including inequalities and oppression and prejudices, like the the local and then the focal and then global? You know, how do I make these changes? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean these are these are million dollar questions, right? And so I think you know I would say it's very hard to say you know whole hog do these things to become a better person, right? But it does seem like you know, one way to tackle this in a more, you know, realistic way, I suppose, is to say, you know, first off, what are the domains that there are difficulties in? Is it, is it smoking? Is it overeating? Is it undersaving? Is it impulsive decision making writ large? And to first say sort of, okay, if it is in fact one of these things, you know, that we have to first say, is the problem that I'm doing too much of something and need to scale it back? Or is that I'm not doing enough of something and need to increase it, right? Because of course, Smoking means I need to stop smoking 
And under saving means I need to start saving, right? And these are different, you know, these are different questions that still both rely on you to essentially say, how will that self on the other side of, of some sort of temporal divide respond to my continued, you know, either engagement or non-engagement, right? And so what I think the research that I've been working on with my colleagues and students suggests is that, you know, one first step, of course, is is just sitting down and, and literally thinking about and having a conversation with and writing a letter to that future self and saying, let's just first make that distant self salient. Let's make it so that people recognize that there is a person on the other side of that divide who will be affected by the things that I do. And okay, yeah, that's that that will be me eventually, but it's a me who is not really present right now at the negotiation table. It's a me who doesn't have a voice in this sort of thing right now, right? And so the poor me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I think that's a, a big step. But then of course there are other sort of structural things that we can do. And we can say, well, I can have that conversation to at least start this sort of process of taking action. And so some of it then relies on saying, what is my point of friction? You know, why is it really hard for me to to save? Is it because I, I don't know who to talk to about this? Is it because I don't feel like I have enough money? Is it because of some of the reasons are maybe I need my money right now because I'm not making enough to think about the future. And that's OK. It would be in a way irrational to say, put away money when I need it right now. But then you could say, well, do I need it for the five dollar and fifty cent? mochaccino I bought from Starbucks? Or would I save $20 a month or $22 a month if I just didn't get, you know, four of those, one a week, right? And that could be something, you know, so what is the source of the friction there? Is it that I drink too much because the alcohol is out on the counter and it's really easy to get to? And so if that's the case, maybe I should put it in a harder to reach place or are my snack foods on the counter or should I put them buried away in the cabinet where I have to take other things out to get to them? And then maybe it'll be, you know, that creates some barrier between me and the action, right? Should I get pistachios that require me to shell them rather than just pop them in my mouth? And I'll probably eat fewer. So it's sort of a matter of degrees of saying, first, you know, I have to just make myself aware that my continued behavior will affect this distant self. And then I'd say, how do I sort of structurally change things so that I either stop doing what I'm doing or how to start doing something that could help me? And, you know, there's a great book called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg that I think really speaks to a lot of these issues as well. It's certainly worth a read and talking about, you know, structuring my environment, saying, why is it that I take that 3 p.m. break to get a cookie? Is it because of the cookie itself or is it because I like interacting with my, my co and taking a break? And if that's the case, maybe we could opt to go for a walk in a different direction away from the cafe where I get that cookie. And now I've sort of changed the habit. So 3 p.m. becomes a break, becomes socialization, but I don't have that extra 300 calories on top of it. So it's the investment in today and now that where the change can be brought upon, as you're saying, which is like reflecting in the given moment and connecting to your goals, as well as you're evaluating a little bit of your action. I find that in my work, uh, what really helps is uh, number one, I think uh, offload that working memory burden, like all these thoughts about future and what my goals are completely are clouded by what information you're processing in the moment. So have Absolutely. a little goal, goals right next to you uh, always constantly. So and develop a habit of reviewing the goal. The second thing is, which I, uh, I love, love, love this idea that was totally inspired by you which was actually getting people, students, or getting my, my patients to write a letter from a future self to the current self and thanking oh. the current self for all the changes the current self is going through. <laughs> and, and I'm living a better life. Like I am on this beach where the sun is shining gloriously and I'm sipping on, you know, <laughs> a cold drink. So kind of giving this visual of, of a pleasant journey of that future self having comfort and desired goals being met. And the third thing, that I find that really helps as well is to kind of having this mini reflection of a little bit in the past, a little bit in the future and finding these routines and organizations and these patterns that repeat themselves. So you don't need to think twice about what am I going to do because you kind of have committed to that action. So I really uh, thank you so much, Hal, for for your presence here and, and uh, all the knowledge you shared with us and of such an interesting, fascinating and engaging conversation. Before I let you go, should anyone have any questions or want to learn more about your work, where should they go? 
Oh, yeah, that's great. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. This was uh, you know, a really engaging conversation. I think the work you're doing is incredibly important, and I'm happy to know that um, some of my work has played a small part in it. So yeah, if uh, people want to contact me further, they can go to my website, halhirschfield.com, or I'm on Twitter at hal underscore eh. Fantastic. Well, thank you once again for making the time to join me on my podcast. Thank you so much. All right. Wow. What a great conversation with Hal Hirschfield. What an intriguing guy. I really enjoyed that conversation, Chitata. Let's lead off. Um, I was particularly intrigued by Hal's take about the brain as a simulator. Yeah, the whole idea that the prefrontal cortex came on board in terms of the evolution process and uh, gave us this gift of seeing possibilities. And the simulation that happens, uh, which are, is activated and supervised by the prefrontal cortex, helps us imagine results going down the future. Now, the interesting thing I think he talked about, that it is a capacity to travel time without leaving the current space. And the future we are talking about may not be literally future means in 40 years, 30 years. It could be literally something that happens next week. So what I got out of that is that we employ our mental tools, such as visual imagery, planning, hypothesizing, problem solving. And we do all that in a brain's working desk, what we call working memory, and imagine the possible ways the future might unfold. And this really helps us to kind of temper our ways, change our ways. All right. So why do we fail to act even when we know how good it is for us? <laughs> such a such a problem, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I see that happening in many ways. The way I understood he explained that I think it's how do we kind of energize the current self and connect that current self to that future self, which appears to be a stranger or somebody in the distant future. A lot of times our capacity to connect to that future me, which appears to be intangible, is not happening through our emotional system. It just is something uh, practically we look at it and our capacity to look at it fails because we just don't have the imagination and actual mental capacity to go that far. And because of that outcome, which is supposed to benefit that future person, which is me, I need to kind of imagine that future person, which is me, mental state of that future person and imagine the condition in which the future person is operating, which is a better future for that person. So imagining a life for that me, which is struggling right now because I'm, I don't have good habits of getting up early. I don't have good habits of eating healthy. And if I change the way I do things now, I can impact my tomorrow's me, which will be enjoying healthy life. And But that just doesn't happen to us all the time because we are so wrapped in the current moment. And the current moment is very concrete and it's right here and right in front of you. And that's what I gathered that why we fail to activate ourselves. Hmm, fascinating. So thinking again about one's future self, I mean, just by looking ahead in time, does one feel a sense of connection to that one's future self? Yeah, I think the disconnect really comes from the distance from current self and future self. Longer the distance, less connection to that future self. So less emotional investment and more of a feeling of a stranger. And, you know, research shows that we don't activate ourselves. We don't sacrifice anything. We don't offer anything for strangers. We tend to do better if we know the person. We tend to do better if the person is our friend. We tend to do better if the person is related to ourselves. The strange thing about this phenomenon of future self is that future self also becomes a stranger Mm. to us. And that stranger then doesn't generate any empathy, any compassion, any love, or any friendship feeling. And research shows that those who find that ability to become friendly with the future self tend to do better. And what I really feel that one of the things that I got out of his talk is the best option we have is to really invest in today and now. I think that investment can pay off if we center our focus around the power of reflection. How do we reflect on our past so that we can invest better in today? How do we learn from our past behaviors and kind of fast forward this and see if I don't change me, I'm going to be probably the same me even tomorrow. 
And what the suffering I'm experiencing today is a byproduct of me not thinking about me in the past. Uh, in the past, I failed to think about my current condition and that's why I'm exactly where I don't want to be. And more we invest in our reflection, the reflective process where we kind of think about ourselves, think about our actions and kind of create a sense of continuity, only then we can create a sense of commitment and foster a great sense of uh, future-oriented progress. Hmm. All right. What a powerful way to close this uh, this entire episode. And again, what a great conversation with Hal Hirschfield. So that's it for today. On behalf of our host, Sucheta Kemeth, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thanks for listening today, and we look forward to seeing you next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.